talk about tonight is global warming. And you hopefully all heard the morning session where um, the positions of uh, several of our panelists uh, were put forward. Um, you know David Dilley, uh, who is a meteorologist, and Peter Tans from uh, NOAA, Gifford Miller from the University of Colorado, and Henry Bauer from Virginia Tech, and apparently a professional panelist. I <laughs> am um, an astronomer, and astronomer's interest in weather has mainly to do, I'm an optical astronomer, whether it's cloudy or not cloudy. So uh, I'm not really, I don't have a big strong position on global warming one way or the other. I will say this, uh, I spent some time in the Netherlands and we came back to the States in 1967 and I can remember listening to, and I've never been able to remember whether it was the Today Show or Johnny Carson, but he had Robert Jastrow, who was a famous astronomer of the day, on, and Jastrow was telling us that we were entering the next ice age. And here we are uh, 30 years later, and we're having a discussion about whether we're going to warm ourselves to death, so to speak. So in any case, uh, this is an issue that has come up in, in, and uh, is fairly active right now. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to sort of review their positions for about five minutes each, and then there will be some time for the panelists to question each other a little bit, and then we'll open it to the floor for the rest of you. I'm going to start with Henry Bauer because he is the one panelist that didn't speak this morning, so we need to hear has, what his feelings are about it, and then we will move, I guess, just down the line, um, letting the panelists speak. So Henry? Yes, and our perspectives are also very different. Uh, two of the speakers this morning are actively engaged directly in research using the mainstream paradigm. David Dilley really has been conducting meta-analysis of an enormous amount of data. And my perspective is from science studies, history, and sociology of science. And one of the things that history teaches is that the mainstream view on a scientific issue is very often too sure of itself. When you're doing research, that's perfectly okay. But if what the researchers say is going to be a basis for public action, then the criterion of certainty has to be rather different. And what uh, is always forgotten is that there's something called the unknown unknown. There are things which it is simply impossible to foresee or to imagine at any given time, and those are the things that periodically pop out at us and make us change our point of view. Now, global warming is not a matter of research. If it were, we wouldn't have a session like this, and we wouldn't have international panels, and we wouldn't have governments talking about it. Global warming is of concern because there are proposals that will saddle every country in the world with enormous burdens of changing ways in which they're doing things and um, the involved costs. Because it is being said that it is 100% certain that emission of CO2 is producing, is adding to the global warming in a way that is so dangerous that we must do something about it, leads to a continual bombardment of statements like this. Global warming will pose an asthma threat. Daily Telegraph 2004. Flood risk will double in 50 years. 
global warming will leave two billion people worldwide vulnerable to catastrophic flooding by 2050. Our energy secretary, Stephen Chu, said, California's farms and vineyards could vanish by the end of the century, and its major cities could be in jeopardy if Americans do not act to slow the advance of global warming, and so on. You've been uh, exposed to these things. I don't believe it is the proper role of science to tell policymakers we are 100% certain about something like this. Uh, Roger Pilkey, who is also at the University of Colorado, has written a book called The Honest Broker, in which he points out that the proper role of science and of scientists is to tell policymakers what is the best evidence on any particular issue, which means including what competent experts say who may happen to disagree with the mainstream consensus. One of my reasons for being skeptical that human-caused global warming is 100% certain is that we were told it was certain 25 years ago or more at a time when that could not possibly have been known in the light of what we've learned since then. Frederick Zeitz, who was a physicist, recipient of the National Medal of Freedom, and a one-time president of the National Academy, said about the International Panel on Climate Change report, the report is not what it appears to be, it's not the version that was approved by the contributing scientists listed on the title page. What they said was, none of the studies cited above has shown clear evidence that we can attribute observed changes to the specific cause of increase in greenhouse gases. No study to date has positively attributed all or part of the change to anthropogenic man-made causes. Any claims of positive detection of significant climate change are likely to remain controversial until uncertainties in the total natural variability of the climate system are reduced. Since then, that was 25 years ago, what do clouds do? Science Magazine 2009. It's uncertain whether clouds act to cool or to warm. In um, 2008, in Nature Geoscience, discovery that methane is being produced by plants, living plants, which hadn't been known at that, up to that time. Most significant from my point of view is that there are thousands of qualified experts who disagree that the evidence is compelling that human actions are causing global warming. And you can read uh, their statements. One of them is the so-called Leipzig Declaration. And it was signed by people qualified in meteorology and related fields who hold prominent positions at research uh, places in Austria, Australia, Belgium, Britain, Canada, the Czech Republic, Germany, Holland, New Zealand, Norway, Poland, Russia, Sweden, and the United States. Amongst the things that might be unknown unknowns, uh, 
two articles were published some time ago showing that in deep boreholes, the temperature has been rising. That's not because of the increase in temperatures anywhere at the surface. It's a result of heat rising from inside the Earth. So there's one factor that is not being taken into account, but there are uh, a bunch of others as well. So my main point is we have here a situation where qualified <coughs> experts disagree with the mainstream consensus. Policymakers, however, are ignoring those, and I believe that that is not a valid thing to do. David? Well, as you recall, this morning I started off by saying uh, about 500 years ago they thought the world was flat, and we know where that went. In 1972, or in 1970s, NASA was saying going into an ice age. Well, we know where that went. 2004 and 5, the strong hurricanes that hit Florida, uh, everyone was saying global warming man-made global warming, stronger hurricanes. And as I told you this morning, Hurricane Center and myself, we both studied this, looked at the cycles, and we had as strong uh, hurricanes back in the 1920s. Uh, it's a cycle. And last year, Mississippi River flood and the big outbreak of tornadoes, cyclical. The tornado outbreak comes about every 60 years. Mississippi River flood, I track on my, uh, my model, comes every 20 to 23 years. It's all cyclical. Everything comes pretty much in cycles. Typical global, global warming cycle uh, comes about every 230 years. Its signature is two twin temperature peaks of 10 years. The last one that we're going through now, 1930s, and from about 1998 to 2008 or 2010. <coughs> this shows up in every single global warming cycle. We've had five global warming cycles during the past 1,200 years, and during the past uh, half million years, 2,200 global warming cycles. However, the media and everyone else seems to want to talk about one global warming cycle. We have to look at the past to find out what the future is. Uh, a cycle also has another cycle in it, a 1,500-year cycle, which I didn't talk about this morning, on a sinusoidal curve. Every 1,500 years, the global warming cycles are warmer. Now, and back between 600 and 800 AD. Then you go back every 1,500 years, and you have the warmer cycles. CO2 decreases and increases with the cycles, especially the 116,000-year interglacial cycle, and also, as I showed this morning, with the 230-year cycle as seen in the plant stomatas. CO2 is a byproduct of global warming, and it is a very good byproduct of global warming. Uh, as I showed this morning, the lunar solar precession which has gravitational pulses 47% above the normal uh, lunar, uh, lunar phases, comes in cycles of nine years, 72 years, 230 years, and 116,000 years, right on the same pulse as all the global warming cycles. And also with the Arctic warm water pulse that comes about every nine years, and the strongest Arctic warming pulse about every 72 years, the twin peaks in the global warming cycles. Uh, the global, war uh, global cooling will begin by 2018. Uh, coldest part of it will be right around uh, 2023 to about 2040, 2050. And our next global warming cycle will be in about the year 2150. The Northwest Passage, which everyone is looking forward to for shorter shipping routes, will be closing down and it will not reopen again for at least another 230 years, and if it doesn't warm enough, up enough at that time, the next opening will be about 120,000 years from now. Uh, we're also, uh, to wrap it up, uh, I showed that the 
global warming cycles when they end within about 20 years of the ending of the global warming cycle in conjunction with the strong global cooling cycles, you have three to four very strong volcanoes. And it is very typical to have a year of no summer uh, with one of the volcanoes. I'm glad you're making a prediction. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, you know, this morning I uh, mentioned or talked about what I think are well-known facts about climate change. And so I'll summarize it again. The first well-known fact is that we are the cause of the CO2 increase. There's not one piece of evidence, but five or six independent pieces of evidence that all show that. Uh, the second thing is that uh, the amount of CO2 that we're emitting is truly amazing. Nine and a half billion tons, metric tons of carbon per year. I will put it in a slightly different perspective from what I did this morning. Nine and a half billion metric tons of carbon is more than the total seasonal net drawdown of all the bottom of the entire biosphere, all forest, all plants, and soils in the Northern Hemisphere. So the net seasonal cycle, the, t the total amplitude from top to bottom corresponds to about five, between five and six billion metric tons of carbon. We human beings are putting in more into the atmosphere every year than that. Uh, <clears throat> The second important fact is that uh, we uh, understand how the extra CO2 and other greenhouse gases will retain heat in the atmosphere. And therefore, mm -hmm. physics and chemistry tell us, I mean, our understanding of quantum mechanics, basically. We understand how atoms and molecules interact with light, infrared light, visible light, and that understanding is actually exquisitely good. And that says that uh, the, the heat, a certain amount of heat, currently 1.2% of the amount that we absorb from the sun will be retained by the atmosphere. Therefore, warming is inevitable and is to be expected, and it is due to us. Now, on top of that, we have actually observed warming. Finally, uh, what we do not know very well is how warm or how much the climate will change. That is still a very uncertain matter because of uh, not very well understood feedbacks and also because some of these feedbacks take decades to play out. And my pessimistic projection for that is that we will eventually learn how, how this system works as it happens as we can observe these feedbacks in coming decades, we will probably learn how it actually works. But then it's also rather late. What is the implication of this? The implication is that our imprint on the Earth as, as a human species is now so large that we are, one could say we are entering a new geologic era. It has been called the Anthropocene where humans really shape the surface, the surface of the Earth. Now, a lot of people find that uncomfortable or are not comfortable. They don't want to acknowledge that because it, of, I guess because of the implications. Because what it means is, as soon as we realize that we are shaping the surface of the Earth, we are responsible. We are responsible to what we leave to current, to future generations, our children and grandchildren and beyond. And we have to actually assume this responsibility and act like it. Thank you. Gifford? Thanks. So, you know, global warming is a fact. And that's, you know, everybody who's looked at that, including people who don't think the humans are related to that, uh, has agreed that the planet's definitely warming. And the, the real question is how unusual is that warming? And this, this morning, David was right, then the past is a way of trying to get a sense of what's going on now and in the future. And, and what the record of the past shows, and the evidence I presented this morning, 
is that the warmth is indeed now unprecedented. That uh, if we look in the Arctic where the signal is the strongest, because uh, whether the plant warms, the Arctic always warms more. When it cools, the Arctic cools more because of the strong positive feedbacks. And there we can say the warmth now exceeds any warmth over the last 5,000 years, and with almost similar assurance in more than 30,000 years. And that exceeds any of the natural cycles, whether they're beating it scale of decades or even centuries, 230 years, whatever those cycles are, what's happening now is outside the range of those cycles because the warmth now exceeds anything that we've seen in at least 5,000 years and probably several tens of thousands of years. And that's, that's basic evidence and I think the observational evidence always will trump models and uh, theories. Yeah, CO2 is, is something we've understood for a long time. Svante Arrhenius back in the 1800s a geo, very famous geochemist, worked out uh, the, the basic mechanisms of CO2 as a greenhouse gas. And, and Arrhenius bemoaned the fact that we weren't burning more fossil fuels because this was late in the Little Ice Age. It was cold. He's Swedish. It was cold up there. He, he was saying if we could just burn more fossil fuels, the planet would warm up. So this, this isn't a new theory or a new idea. This has been around for way over 100 years. There's no uncertainty that CO2, adding more CO2, won't increase the temperature of the planet. That's that's a that's a known. The, the the people who spend their lives studying how the climate system works have willing to sign on that at 95% confidence, the anthropogenic addition of CO2 is warming the planet. Now, if I was the CEO of Exxon Mobil and my geophysicist told me they had 95% confidence that was a pool of oil at a particular depth somewhere in the planet. And my engineers had 95% confidence that the tools were available to extract that safely. I would invest large sums of money following the 95% odds that there is a chance of an extractable uh, resource there. So I think that 95% level of confidence is enough that we should be paying serious attention to it. So there's, there's really no longer a debate whether the planet, certainly not that the planet's warming, not that there's a human role in there. The real <coughs> debate should be, what should we do about it? Yes. That's where the discussion should be. And, and I would suggest next time that you meet next year, you hold that debate. The planet's warming, we're responsible. What should we do? Because it's not obvious what the best factors are to make steps forward. I mean, there's really three pieces to it. There's acknowledgement that this is an issue. You have to have buy-in by a lot of people, otherwise nothing will happen. And then there's an adaptation. Peter made a strong point this morning that the changes are going to come no matter what we do. So we have to learn, develop adaptation strategies. And the other one is mitigation, because the most serious threat to humans is not the warming planet. The end product is probably something like the Pliocene, for those of you who are geology people and pay attention to what's in the past. It's not necessarily a, a worse world. The thing that we have the greatest difficulty in accommodating is abrupt changes. And if we don't mitigate those forcings that we're adding, the chances of there being unexpected, unknown unknowns, abrupt changes, <coughs> just simply increases. So we have a responsibility to our children's children and children to mitigate what we're doing. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and so what I think we should do now is ask if you have questions for each other, and we'll take a few minutes for that if you do. If you don't, we will go on to the audience. I have a comment for Henry. Okay, Peter. Scientists never have 100% certainty. Exactly. And what the IPCC reports state, they never state 100%. They state very confident, confident, reasonably confident. And they, they have assigned numbers to that, actually, what that means, high confidence, etc. It is never certain. But like Gibbs said, if physical scientists say that something, that are very confident of something, you better pay attention. I also want to point out that the summary for policymakers of the IPCC is exceedingly conservative in its statements. It is not just what the the lead authors of the chapters put together, no, the summary for policymakers have been signed off on by representatives of every government, including the Bush administration. No, you know, 
So you can imagine this is a very conservative statement. And you better pay attention to what it says. It says, yes, this is a serious issue. Not that anybody has actually done anything. But. So it's, uh, it's, it's much more nuanced than the way you presented it. 95% is not 100%. What the policy so makers much. are being told is that there is no doubt that the production of CO2 is adding to global warming in a dangerous fashion. Uh, ten years ago, Bjorn Lomborg wrote a book called The Skeptical Environmentalist, and he didn't question that CO2 is causing, adding to global warming. But he pointed out that all of the solutions being proposed, namely to cut down the rate of uh, emission of CO2, would not have an appreciable enough effect to make it unnecessary to adapt to the global warming changes, and that therefore it would make a lot of sense not to try to cut CO2 emissions, but to plan for adaptations to rising sea levels and so on. What happened to Lomborg? He was in a book review in Nature, he was compared with a Holocaust denialist for saying that it was not necessary to cut CO2 emissions. Are there other questions amongst the panelists? Well, I'd like to uh, comment on, on this sure, also. Sure, um, I believe it was probably about 10 years ago the IPCC came out with a, about a 95% uh, uh, confidence level saying, we're going to continue having uh, global warming. It's going to increase by an X amount of degrees in the next 10 years, 20 years. Yes, it's on. That, that was a 95% uh, uh, confidence level back about 10 years ago. However, uh, just a couple of years ago, they had to revise the forecast. The temperature did not go up during that 10-year period. And a couple of years ago, they said, well, the temperatures are now going to remain flat for the next 10 years, and then we're going to have warming taking off again. So just a matter of five years, they shot their 95% way down al already. They, they lost their uh, forecast right there. They had to revise their forecast. So their 95% confidence level is much, much lower than 95%. My confidence level of natural cycles, because they had to recognize a natural cycle that was keeping temperature about the same for 10 years. They, they recognized a natural cycle. And I showed you the natural cycles. They have a 95% confidence level that's much lower than that now. I have a 99% confidence level that the natural cycles are going to be the dominant factor. Are there other questions among like the I panelists? Like I said, I'm glad you're making a prediction. Now it's yeah. 99%. Okay. 99.9%. Okay. What about that one? Uh, are there other questions? I, I, I have one other com okay. comment. Uh, I'm not questioning that human actions are producing appreciable effects. Uh, I think our greatest problem is there are too many people on Earth. One of the greatest problems of using fossil fuels is that they distribute randomly heavy metals which are toxic and which True. will uh, never cold. be able to be removed again. And uh, it, uh, environmental quality in general decreases. But human actions are not adding to global warming because of CO2. Hello? Other questions? <laughs> yes. I agree. I'm yeah. trying to get off of the. I, I have a what question. What is the basis of that final statement there? That, that CO2, human produced CO2 is not adding to global warming? But, you can't just make a statement without some the, evidence. The evidence is not conclusive that emission of CO2 is adding to the rate of global warming. Okay. David, you want to ask the question? The yes, I have a question. Uh, this morning, uh, uh, you did a wonderful talk on, uh, on the uh, up in the Arctic, the glacier, 
which you say has, uh, is smallest now than it has been in 5,000 years or over 37,000 years. And uh, what I was kind of wondering is the cycles. Uh, I was talking about uh, a cycle where the global warming cycles are the warmest every 12, uh, 1,500 years, every 1,500 years. And you, you keep saying it was warmer it's warmer now than it was 5,000 years ago. However, 5,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, there was 50% less ice in the Arctic. And if you look at the figures on the temperatures, it was much warmer back at that time than it is now. And as far as the glacier, every 1,500 years when we have the warmer global warming cycles, that glacier would be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So of course it's smaller today than it was 5,000 years ago. It should be smaller than today, but it's a natural cycle. Uh, it's, it's actually been cooling for the last 5,000 years, so the glaciers have in general been growing over that period of time because the Earth has been moving farther from the sun. I thought you said uh, today we're warmer than we have been in the fi yeah, past 5,000 years. That is correct, but up until the last century, the ice has been in, on average growing because there's been less energy coming in from the sun because the northern hemisphere summer keeps occurring farther and farther from the distance of the sun. That's a simple relationship. It's a square of the distance. That the so are we warmer or are we colder we than 5,000 years ago? Warmer than any time in the last 5,000 years, despite the fact yes. that there's 10% less energy coming in from the sun. The only plausible yes. explanation is that the greenhouse effect overall is greater. Then why did we have 50% less ice in the Arctic five to 6,000 years ago? <laughs> It, it, I don't know where you get the, you know, you don't have the, the figures of the temperature 5,000 years ago. I mean, you're, you're wrong when you say that it was warmer than it is now. It is now warmer than it was 5,000 years ago, and all the ice is melting. The Greenland ice sheet is melting. It has a, a long time constant because it takes it a while to melt. I have a graphic on my computer that shows the temperatures 5,000 years ago, the created well, temperatures, and they're warmer. I don't know where you get the data warmer. from. These, uh, I've well, never seen that data. Well, okay, I'll show it to you. It's, it's clear that we're not getting very far on the panel up here, <laughs> back and forth. So now is an opportunity for you to uh, ask questions and add input. Uh, I would like you to give your name, and if it's a question, that would be ideal. If you just want to make a statement, keep it very short. Yes. Make sure it's turned on. There's a switch somewhere there. You got it. It's underneath. I think we got it now. Okay, thank you very much for <clears throat> a very interesting comments. Uh, I think there is a rational approach to this, and I, I guess this dovetails on what Henry was saying. Uh, if we were to cut CO2 emissions, like right away, all of a sudden, you know, drastically, no. uh, I, I expect that uh, warming would continue anyway. It does seem to me that in, in an, uh, this era, particularly in this austere area, uh, if we are to decide where to spend scarce financial resources on how to deal with it, uh, we would try to reduce the human footprint, not just carbon, but, you know, with the reduction of species, lack of fresh water. I mean, there's any number of things. It seems like the adaptation that Henry was talking about would be where to put our scarce financial resources as far as dealing with it, regardless of what the science says about CO2 emissions and global warming. I'd like to hear all of your comments on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. pop in on that. I mean, the, so the, I mean, there's two parts of that. There's certainly no question that there's a lot of issues out there that we should be concerned about and reducing our overall footprint's important. I think the biggest challenge for us will always be rate of change. And things that change rapidly, we have a much harder time adapting to. Sea level will rise. That's the, the clearest prediction of a warmer planet. Sea level has to rise. If it rises slowly, we can move cities out of the way in time. If it rises rapidly, it's a catastrophe. And so th th this is the debate that really should be going on. What is the way we should invest <coughs> the resources available to us to address the coming changes? I want to say uh, the last speaker was right, that if we were to stop CO2 emission 100% right now, the Earth would still continue to warm because the oceans haven't yet caught up with the present level of CO2. There's a, a half a degree or centigrade or so of warming is already in the pipeline. Nobody is saying that we should cut CO2 emissions suddenly. That's a disaster. We all know that. 
Now, what we ought to do is come up with sensible policies, policies to wean ourselves from our dependence on fossil fuels. And one of the arguments is that we shouldn't be dependent on oil from the Middle East. I mean, is this a national security issue? And actually, we can do that. Now, is that worth the investment? That's something we can debate about. Well, as I showed uh, in my presentation this morning, uh, there is evidence that CO2 was as high a thousand years ago as it was today. No. That's incorrect. No. You were, were you sitting there at my presentation? This were you sitting there at my presentation this morning? I didn't, I didn't recognize your figures. <laughs> Those aren't my facts. No, I did, I didn't. That is not my research. They that is someone else's. Me. They were entirely new to me. That is peer-reviewed research by Dr. Beck. Oh, yeah, I know him, yes. He makes it up. Okay. If you made your statement, you need, need some more time to speak. No, that's okay. fine. Henry, would you like to comment? Well, I, I fully agree. We should wean ourselves from having to use fossil fuels, especially oil. But I believe that we shouldn't use bad, wrong reasons for saying that that's what we should do, because sooner or later that will backfire on us. One of the things that hasn't been mentioned is that over the history of the Earth, global temperature has varied over a range of 15 degrees centigrade. In the last million years, it has varied over a range of six degrees centigrade. We are now just coming out of one of the rare short periods of cold. So there's no question that things are warming up for reasons that are quite separate from CO2 and reasons, moreover, which we don't understand. There is no agreed reason for those 15 degree and 6 degree ranges. So there is no way in which we can know from data in the last 100 years that the rate of warming is greater than it was at one of the earlier periods of warming. Okay, next question. Thanks for having this great um, debate. My name is Sky Nelson, and uh, I appreciate what's being said, and I'm sort of emotionally charged, I guess, as many of us are on this issue. Uh, my, my question is, I guess, to Henry and to David, um, specifically, although anyone can answer. It sounds like we do not, um, whether or not, wherever the evidence is, I mean, I, I, I know where the evidence is, uh, but regardless of that, we know that there's a need to act for two reasons. One, because the consequences are so dire uh, if the current models that I understand are correct of climate change. Uh, so expensive, I should say, if you just want to put it in those terms. Much more expensive to wait and see and have to adapt quickly to uh, moving our cities, dealing with forests dying, uh, and various other effects that would happen from global climate change. Much more expensive to wait and see than to do it, than to do, be a little proactive about it. And we don't need evidence, the second point would be, the question would be, we don't need evidence to know that a change needs to be made if, if I am uh, eating too much of high fat foods, for instance. I know that a system like my body needs to be in balance. We know that, it, we know that about the, the planet as well, it needs to be in balance. So how is it possible that um, we can uh, justify the amount of carbon that we're putting in the atmosphere and not uh, take action to mitigate that and to, to limit it, even if we don't agree on the evidence. Thank you. How to justify the amount of carbon in the atmosphere? How to justify not taking action if we Without don't taking some action. One, one yeah, of the I, I agree with the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> one of the problems of, uh, of modern life is that lots of things are being done that you could not justify on a rational basis. But uh, we are living in a very complex sort of society where just because you can see that something would be reasonable to do doesn't mean that it will get done. 
but still our duty to argue and to make arguments and talk to people that we should do what is reasonable, even though we are not always successful. That's our obligation. It's a moral obligation on the part of scientists who understand climate change. And also, if you agree, you have a moral obligation to try to act on this. One, uh, one I, thing I'd like to point out is the ice core samples that I showed, the uh, 116,000 year cycles, uh, where scientists say carbon dioxide has never been above 300 parts per million. And I showed you this morning, those are mean values of 200 to 1,000 years. Mean values. They take in five global warming cycles where you have ups and downs over 1,000 years. If you mean any data, you're going to eliminate all the spikes in the data. And they're saying it was 298 parts per million, the mean data, and they say it's never been higher than that. Anyone with any knowledge at all knows it has to be higher than 298 if you're meaning it over a thousand years. We know we, over and over on these cycles, we approach higher, much higher levels of CO2. So why should we act on looking at one carbon dioxide cycle? That's what we're looking at. One carbon dioxide cycle during the past hundred years, and we want to take action that will economically hurt the whole world. We don't have to do that. Carbon dioxide is a very good gas. Through photosynthesis, plants take in carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. This is a natural cycle that has been set up by God, by the creator of the world and the universe. And we want to tinker with it. And I don't care what you guys say. Read your Bible. Uh, I can, I can, my wife and I um, were in Holland in January. My wife is Dutch and we go there frequently. I can tell you that all of the Dutch coastal towns are raising the dikes. <laughs> so at least there is some society that is busy getting ready for this. Can I yes. just clarify yeah. that, that ice CO2 issue? I mean, David argued earlier that the ice in the center of Antarctica is incapable of seeing the, the, the more recent times because of the slow closure for the CO2. If you go to the coastal areas where the precipitation is more rapid, the CO2 from trapped air bubbles in ice actually extends, overlaps with the instrumental record. And for that period of overlap, they give the exact same amount of CO2. And it shows in, in the present interglacial of the last 10,000 years, the CO2, even if you look at it year by year, is no more than 280 parts per million. So and these large variations, sim you know, we have absolute yes. measurements of what happened, and they simply do not exist. And it is not visible in 200-year cycles. They are not there. And what are you comparing the 10,000-year uh, cycles to? Do you have an instrument to compare that to? How can you verify it? Listen, the, the samples from the center of Antarctica are an average. When you measure CO2 in air bubbles, they are an average of several hundred years, perhaps, between you know, 500 and 800 years. And, but you talk about cycles that are spikes that must be present there, but they are not present in the samples. You, it's an hypothesis of yours. You say they must be there. Well, it's not in the data. That's because it takes, um, it, it takes such a long, it takes 7,000 years for it to, uh, the bubbles to become locked in in the, in yes. the new ice. So now, you are taking readings in the uh, okay. ice that receive greater snowfall. And, then and it locks in quicker, like I know that. But you don't, don't have them there. but you don't have instrument data to compare that to from uh, 100 or, or 500 years ago. Think, so you don't, don't know if it's locked in or not. I don't think we're going to resolve okay. this, uh, at least tonight. We might resolve it sometime, but not tonight. Next question. Well, hopefully this question is relevant. Um, <laughs> I hope so, too. <laughs> John, John Kinneman, University of Colorado series, former NOAA. Um, I tried to think of how to put this as a question so that it's not entirely a comment. Uh, and so uh, the, the question is, what is the proper use of historical analysis? And it, it's a loaded question, so in Roger Pilkey style, I'll reveal my bias, which we all have. Uh, 
In particular, I think that historical analysis is properly used to determine causes in a system. We detect patterns, we investigate those patterns, and we try to find out what the system is doing. What historical analysis is not good for is prediction. If it were, David would be a very rich man today, having invested wisely in the stock market based on his historical analysis of the cycles. Also, uh, in medicine, uh, simply because I tend to get sick once a year doesn't mean I don't go to the doctor this year to find out why I'm sick or what the diagnosis and prognosis might be. Furthermore, something that's not going to be discussed here is uh, ecology. We are currently in one of the greatest extinction events on the planet ever recorded, probably equal to the greatest. Um, under this logic of historical analysis, we should ignore it because it happened before. So that's, that's my, my basic question, and as far as David's last comment, I believe God gave us brains so that we use them. Well, uh, we should learn from history, and one of the things we learn from history is that competent scientists disagree for certain periods of time on important issues, and that the mainstream consensus has often turned out to be wrong. I fully agree with Peter Tanz that it is a moral obligation for scientists to tell the truth as they see it. The trouble is that equally qualified scientists don't always see the truth in the same way. If you go to the website www.sepp for science and environmental policy project.org, it was founded by Fred Singer, Professor Emeritus of the University of Virginia, and Professor Emeritus of, from George Mason University who held highly responsible positions in a number of institutions, both in research and in policy. One of the things that is wrong with debates about things like global warming is that they become politicized. And in the global warming debate, as in many others, it is common practice to say that those who disagree with the mainstream view are right-wing political conservatives. That is not only irrelevant, it's also wrong. Because I worked for Obama in 2008, I'm gonna work for him again in 2012, and I happen to agree with Fred Singer, who is a right-wing conservative. But we agree with one another on the basis of evidence, not of politics. I agree that we should agree on the basis of evidence. I know Singer actually quite well. I'm sure. And it's also an interesting book. He was described in a book by uh, Naomi Oreskes, O-R-E-S-K-E-S. -E the title is Merchants of Doubt, and Singer is one of the main characters being described. Oreskes is a historian of science. As he points out that Singer was wrong on the issue of whether smoking is bad for your health. He was also wrong on the ozone hole. He was also wrong on the acidification of lakes, acid rain. And, and he has quite a track record, yeah, actually. You see, this is another type of argument which is irrelevant and wrong. And I can tell you why. Wait, he doesn't wait, look at evidence. Wait, wait a minute. The fact that a person can be wrong on three issues doesn't mean they're wrong on the fourth. There are a number of issues that I've been wrong about, and there are a number that I've been right about. You learn from history, actually. Okay, uh, next question from the audience. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the very insightful uh, conversation, and it's very educational. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ross, Ross Locklear. I am from Roxborough, Colorado. Um, this, I would like to hear from every panelist. Um, I guess um, your personal and professional 
truthful recommendation to the, to the world leaders. Uh, what are your realistic, the most realistic, heart-driven strategies that you will recommend to the, to the world leaders? How do we move forward uh, with this global warming? Thank you. I, I, I wish I could uh, give you an insightful answer. I think that the first step is acknowledgement. I mean, we, we have to have a global consensus that this is an issue of importance. Without that, we can't get any uh, meaningful action. And, and uh, that doesn't seem to be happening. I think it's, it's rather discouraging. But uh, the exact, you know, clearly we have to reduce fossil fuel. We, there's nobody is, who's sensible is arguing that we should immediately stop burning fossil fuel because that's simply not going to happen. But we need to transition to a sustainable energy economy, and that's that's the step that we have to do, which doesn't release uh, greenhouse gases or other pollutants to the atmosphere. There are examples, actually, of where states have been successful in doing this. For the, the Sweden, uh, after the oil shocks in the 1970s, decided for economic reasons not to lower the dependence on imported energy. And so they went on an energy efficiency program and they also for electricity went nuclear. And they managed with technology in the 1970s to decrease their per capita CO2 emissions by a factor of two. We know this can be done. Anybody else on the panel want to mention? Well, I, I don't think it's our role. We're not competent to tell world political leaders what to do. That's why we happen to be scientists or historians and not politicians. What we should do is to make plain to them what the division and the range of opinions is on any given matter. Next question from the audience. Yeah, my, uh, my name is Nuzi Hanif, and my question has to do with remote viewing. I don't know if any of the panelists uh, believe in remote viewing or consider it to be a, a valid method of obtaining information, but I'll still ask my question. Do you know if any serious effort has been made to engage any expert and credible remote viewers to help us find out um, information about global warming and what causes it and whether it's happening or not. It, can you explain to me <laughs> what remote viewers are? Yes. Maybe somebody on the panel can do that? Or, I mean, Henry, do you want to take I, that on? I, I don't. Remote I don't. viewing is a situation uh, where someone, let's say, in the laboratory and some other person is out in the community and the person in the laboratory remotely determines what the other person is looking at. There are lots of variations of that but that's what's re called remote viewing. And many people, some in this crowd, accept okay. that courage. Okay. And not necessarily the laboratory. I mean, no, no, in real I, world I, applications, I, one of the, I think, last year's conference, or maybe the year before <coughs> that, person had described an experiment where people who had done remote viewing for the U United States military department of defense and so forth were engaged to do remote viewing to determine or at least provide information of what might be happening yeah. on the planet Mars. And I so was forth. trying to give a so, two second yeah, anyway, explanation. So I wondered if you had any information. You, you should ask uh, for names of people who might know about that. You should ask Courtney Brown, say. Next question from the audience. Hi, my name is Emery. I'm from New York. Um, I'm going to uh, put forward a, a metaphor, and I'm interested in uh, if it uh, draws any comments from you. The metaphor would be um, civilizations have seem to have a natural rise and fall, and with that comes the <coughs> development of technology. And uh, so we're in a civilization, and it has risen, and with that has come the rise of technology. And that rise of technology has been uh, let's say, exceeding the, all the other cycles by a huge amount. We now have the ability to explore the, uh, the, the universe, and we have the internet. Um, uh, I, I feel like this metaphor uh, might be applicable to the one we're currently at, where 
Uh, we have natural rise and fall of, of climate change and of, uh, <coughs> of CO2. Um, so uh, uh, do you have any comment on that? I'd like to comment on that. Uh, you're talking about new technology, and that was it exactly what I was showing in my presentation this morning was new technology uh, for uh, forecasting climate changes uh, by looking at uh, the gravitational field of the Earth and Moon, and also you can use the uh, the sunspot monitor minimums or uh, increases, uh, which have all been proven to have effects on the world's temperatures. And my technology is brand new. There are some other scientists in the world using the same type of technology as I am. The governments are not, because it has not been funded by grants anywhere, so the governments are unaware of this technology. This is t new technology, and yes, this should be applied to our problems uh, in the future if you look at new technology. This is what everything is about, new technology, new technology for energy. And on my presentation, I've shown we're all ready to go into very deep global cooling. So why should we ruin, ruin the world's economy by going on a chase with technology that we do not even have, or a very good technology? In 50, 75 years, we're going to have great technology for, for differing uh, energy. We can wait for that. We have plenty of fossil fuel energy. Fossil fuel is not hurting the world. It is not. It is very good for plant life. We need vegetation. We have seven billion people here on the earth, and it's been proven that during the past 10 years, vegetation is growing faster, and we have more people to feed. Any other comments? Well, the, the risk of climate change is that uh, it might become more difficult to feed the world's people because it will have effects on the hydrologic cycle and on plants also, you know, we, we are dominating the earth now. Uh, I would say, um, oh, I want to say something about we can't afford to decrease emissions. I was thinking about earlier. In, I mentioned Sweden as an example of a country that cut its emissions in half. The, Per capita GDP of Sweden was slightly less than the U.S. when they started this effort. And when they finished it 20 years later, it was still slightly less of the United States. A drop in per capita GDP relative to the U.S. simply did, was not there. So don't say that we can't afford it. It's just how you do it. We know how to do it. Well, we can't do it by giving grants to companies for solar energy that uh, is not economically feasible. And that's what we're doing. We're giving grants to, to purchase the equipment for people so when we don't have to do this. Getting a little off the, onto the politi political you, side, Henry. Can you imagine how Congress would react to the statement, Sweden did it, let <laughs> us do it? Uh, yeah, I can very well imagine that. And Congress is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> OK, next question from the audience. Aside, and I, the new technology, I think, is an important issue. And, and you know, the, the, large, the best predictor for year-to-year -year climate variability, which has real economic impacts, is the status of ENSO. David has argued that he can predict it years in advance. And, and with new technology, I suggest all of you invest a lot of money in David's operation. Because if you can do that, you'll be a very rich man. And you will be, too. Yeah. Yeah. I was the only one that would correctly forecast the ENSO in 2009. No one else forecasted. I had it forecast two years in advance. I had this one forecast right on the nose. Also, uh, the hurricane center was the uh, Colorado State knocked down the hurricane forecast for this year because they expected an ENSO this summer. I told Dr. Gray, uh-uh, it's not coming until Christmas. Now they're revising their forecast again. And so, towards Christmas and a very bad hurricane season. So yes, I do have some great technology here, and people should listen. Okay. okay. Yeah. Next question from the audience. It's more like comments. My name is Lou Marinkovich. Uh, for 30 years, I was a paleontologist who specialized in the environmental history of the Arctic Ocean during the past 65 million years. And. Uh, I've documented in my own research, published in really good journals like Nature and Science and so forth, 
what the what the different climate wor warmings were or coolings over the past 65 million years. So I have several comments, so I'll make them quick. It's been said that there's a 95% or whatever confidence that people affect the climate. It's actually not something that's subject to probability. Either Schrodinger's cat's dead or alive. Uh, number two, uh, somebody said that there hasn't been this uh, degree of warp for, for the past 5,000 years. But there was an episode called the medieval warm period from the 5th to the 10th centuries when the climate was several degrees warmer in the, in the northern hemisphere where it's, it's best documented. And up to 75,000 Vikings were living on Greenland, which is just rocks and snow today. So we have tw 25 human generations that didn't know they were living, uh, that they, it was never going to get that warm again. It's not clear to me over the long term, <coughs> half a billion years, that CO2 is even a greenhouse gas for the following reasons. Geophy geochemists have published a myriad of papers documenting the climate and CO2 over the past half billion years. They use uh, carbon isotopes from uh, corals and seashells and other sea creatures to, as a proxy for uh, CO2. And they use oxygen isotopes, oxygen 1816, for a temperature proxy. So you can see big uh, leaps in temperature, high or low, and then big sweeping changes in CO2, and they don't correlate. At least for the last half billion years, they don't. Sometimes CO2 is high during an ice age, say 200 million years ago. Sometimes CO2 is high and it's warm. But there's no consistent correlation at all. So it's not clear that over time, a lot of time, CO2 is even a greenhouse gas. CO2 values have been two to three times what they are today in the past, including during cool episodes around the world. In the Vostok cores that the Russians took in Antarctica, that goes back 400,000 years, uh, I believe Mr. Tilly uh, had uh, an illustration of the graph. You can see climate it getting warmer and colder, warmer and colder, ice ages happening, and interglacial inter, inter ice ages happening. But the temperature always goes up first, up to 800 years before the CO2 goes up. So indeed, they both go up, but first the temperature does in every single episode of warming spikes for the last 400,000 years in Antarctica. Oh, and then the Milankovitch cycles, and since my last name is Marinkovich, I know a lot about this. The Milankovitch cycles, which are sediment cycles, sediments deposited in the ocean, uh, reflect the warm and cold, warm and cold, warm and cold over time. At the moment, they're kicking into a cold mode. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Anybody want to comment on his comments? Yeah, I'll respond. And I know Dr. Marinkovich's work, uh, excellent work on paleontology and Arctic Ocean. Uh, but, he, but he's wrong on the medieval period. The, the, we are currently, based on a vast array of data, <laughs> we are currently warmer on average than we were in, in the medieval period. That's, Yes. Uh, I'm I sorry. I to comment too yeah. that we do know that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. This follows directly from our understanding of quantum mechanics. Wait, one other issue, yes, I, I, that's, a, that's a given. The, the other that's issue a given. Is, is, is the ice core CO2 record. There was a, a very good paper that came out in Science earlier yes. this year that summarized the evidence for global temperatures and CO2. The Vostok record and, and the Ethica record, all those long ice core records from Antarctica are reflecting a very local temperature signal, not a global signal. And so what, what's been done is to put together the global signal of temperature, and in, that, in those reconstructions, the global temperature follows the CO2. So CO2 rises, global temperature follows the rise in CO2. And you can look in science, it's only so, a yeah. months ago that paper came out. And that was totally debunked also. I'm sorry, but it was not. Yes, it was. Well, we're not going to. Yeah. Totally debunked. Very quickly. <laughs> well, I'm not aware of it. <laughs> okay. I read uh, the literature pretty carefully. Next question from the audience. Good evening, uh, Manuel Rivera. Uh, I'm not an expert on this subject, but it seems to me uh, 
maybe incorrectly, that the burning of fossil fuels would release to the atmosphere other chemicals besides CO2, probably unwanted chemicals. And uh, even if this is incorrect, there are other factors like uh, the peak oil phenomena. There was this year a paper published in Nature, which uh, I don't remember exactly the title, but paraphrasing it, it uh, basically concluded that we are definitely right now in peak oil. Uh, considering this, considering the fact that we are now looking to drill in areas where it has uh, sensible ecosystems, uh, and if I had more time, I probably could come up with several more reasons why we should move away from fossil fuels. So even if fossil fuels, the burning of fossil fuels has nothing to do with global warming, there's probably a uh, large list of reasons of why we should move away from fossil fuels, and I would like to hear the comments of the panel on this. Uh, we also have a pretty large list why we should be moving away from wind power. Uh, they, they kill enormous amount of birds, for one thing, and they're also putting out a low-frequency noise. Uh, there's a study being done up in Maine from uh, sound acoustic engineers. Uh, they were performing some work beside a large wind termite. And uh, they're in this house for about three or four days, and they started to get sick, feeling just horrible. They couldn't understand why. So uh, about a few days later, they had to leave to go to an, another job, and they felt better. Then they came back, and within a day after getting back, to that research point where the wind turbine was, they started to feel very ill again. Dizziness, confusion. And they're writing a paper right now. They have found out that the wind turbines give off a low frequency noise we can't hear. It comes into the house and what they have is motion sickness from the wind turbines. Now, the motion sickness is probably uh, about a five mile radius of the wind turbines, which means you have to put up a huge buffer zone this is what's going to happen in the future. A very huge buffer zone for wind turbines. Among that, they're also killing bats and bald eagles and many other species. Um, that, that's very interesting, but I'm not proposing to move towards wind energy. Uh, well, that's an alternative energy, and that's uh, what you want to do, Any, move from fossil fuels. Anybody else the panel want to comment on other I want to say something energy. about the birds. Uh, the early generation uh, wind uh, turbines actually killed uh, an enormous number of birds because the structure invited birds to nest there. So one big advance was actually to make a smooth tower that didn't give a place for birds to sit and build a nest. That decreased the bird kill by an enormous factor. I don't know what the numbers are right now, but that was actually some a lesson that had to be learned. Well, they have uh, an island in Maine where it's uh, already killed five by uh, bald eagles in the past uh, year. And if we went out and shot one, we'd, we'd be in jail. Okay. Now, there's something about coal, yeah. Uh, so you are in favor of coal, it seems. The whole no, period I, of I, I never, I never coal. mentioned coal. Well, well, never mentioned coal. Well, we were talking about wind turbines. I, I okay, don't quite get the connection here. I don't think we're getting about anywhere. Talk about pollution. Coal we're is the any, worst. We're not getting anywhere on this one either. Yeah. York. Um, a, a, a couple of brief remarks. Uh, first, I wanted to express my uh, extreme disappointment at learning that Dr. Miller had de declined to allow his talk to be recorded because I thought it was a, a very good presentation and certainly deserved to be archived and, and uh, preserved. Um, I might have had another actual question, but it was rather driven out of my head <laughs> by my shock at hearing one of the panelists uh, invoke God as the creator of the world for a basis for uh, considering that things are okay and we shouldn't meddle with them that is a perfectly legitimate theological position, but it is simply fraud to pass it off as science. Anybody on the panel want to comment on that? All right. Uh, since, since we raised my, my point, and, and I did ask that my right. presentation not be uh, taped or released to the media because the data I showed you has not yet been published, and it, it uh, 
compromises my ability to, to publish it if it comes out in other means. So I, I apologize that I, had, I did that, but I wanted to give you the most up-to-date information that I've got, and that meant that I, I did ask that it not be. Yeah, I, I agree with you. If you want to, if you submit something to a, a journal like Nature or Science, and they find out that you it's already published somewhere, they will not accept it. Next question. Uh, this is a question and a bit of a suggestion uh, addressed to the two scientists on the left. Um, <clears throat> do you think that perhaps we made a slight blunder in calling it uh, global warming? Because people think in terms of temperature. And what I'm thinking is that it's the real problem is global heating. It is a capture of heat in the system that then has to be released to space through various different mechanisms. And uh, a one or two degree increase in temperature doesn't excite the public and doesn't compute very well with politicians. But when you start talking about what heat does, that's a different story. Yeah, heat, heat puts more energy in the atmosphere. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, more water, so there's currently more water vapor in the atmosphere than there was before, say 30 years ago. And that translates to energy. And the expectation as a result of that is of more weather extremes. I, I Any other? Yeah. Say, just a, just a quick comment yeah. that we've, we've, from the scientific side, we've not done an effective job of conveying to the public the, the either the basis or the importance of the observations that things are changing in ways that are unprecedented. And, 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 and as evidence for that, I'll say the fact that we're sitting here still debating something that to me is, is beyond debate. We should be talking about what we're about it, not whether this is what's the the question that. was uh, a semantic one. Would it have been better to call it heating rather than warming? Would that be more effective? What I've been interested in is that more and more frequently the talk is about climate change, which is non-falsifiable, instead of talking about human-caused global warming, which is potentially falsifiable. Uh, I certainly agree. With, uh, Stephen Hall from Orlando, Florida. Um, Freeman Dyson, who I'm sure you all know is a great scientist, one of the criticisms he has had, and others as well, is uh, about climate models, the computer models, which uh, uh, he's criticized them as simply not being complete, not having all the variables available. Uh, and much of the climate research and forecasting is based on those computer models. So I would like to get each of you to comment on that. And I agree with that. I, I refrain from a prediction. All I'm saying is we run a great risk because there's a flip side to us not being able to make a good, good prediction. There's a very large range in the predicted aspects of climate change by computer models for good reasons because we do not understand these feedbacks well enough but that's at the same time tells us that we are in a risky business because none of these parameterizations that give these more extreme predictions are demonstrably idiotic they seem reasonable one thing we must remember is water vapor is 96 percent of the greenhouse gases, and everyone's ignoring water vapor, which no, also. Then why are we arguing about uh, only CO2? Water vapor is 96 percent of the greenhouse gas, and it also varies. Uh, as we warm, we also get more water vapor in the air, causing greenhouse gas, causing uh, trapment of air of uh, warm air. Yes. That's a positive feedback. That's right. Now, as far as the IPCC models and other models, they are only as good as the information put into the computer models. You have to have good information to put into the models. This is why the IPCC forecast back 10 years ago was totally wrong, and they had to revise it just a few years after that. Actually, they've revised it, their forecast about three times already, and I'm not revising my forecast at all. And remember the 10-year cycles, 10-year uh, warm periods we're talking about in the 1930s and now, but the signature on all the global warming cycles. We're coming at the end of that cycle right now, and people are trying to debunk this when we haven't even gotten out of the cycle yet to head into this. You have to look at this and take care of it, because remember I told you about the very sharp 
global cooling coming in, very sharp, which would be extremely dangerous for people here on Earth, for our, our uh, food supplies. And if we don't heed warning on this, and I'm not the only one saying this, there are many scientists throughout the world starting to step forward on this now. And we can't get our voices because of the media. And we need to have people look at both sides of the situation and not just go to one view. We have to look at both of them, and it's not being done. Okay, next question from the audience. Uh, my name is Paul Huspany, and uh, just I, a few, I guess, philosophical comments here, and maybe it'll ultimately lead into a question or two. But what I find interesting here, this is the first time I've attended one of these, one of these conferences, is that we, we have within our panel um, the same kind of division and from what I've observed here, quite frankly, acrimony related to this issue that I've observed. And I have to admit, I'm not a regular reader of the more erudite magazines like Nature and so forth. My, my bent tends to be more engineering related, so I read magazines like Chemical and Engineering News, which is a publication of the American Chemical Society, Physics Today, which of course is the American Physics Society, and uh, <clears throat> also maybe a little bit lower brow uh, magazines like Popular Science and Popular Mechanics. But the thing that has struck me, and I've seen this uh, same type of very vigorous discussion going on really over the last few years in the editorial columns of chemical and engineering news, physics today, exactly the same kinds of things that are being debated here. And so it's a very active, uh, and I, I would have to say very polarized type of debate already at this point, which I think is, is coming out very starkly here, which I think is unfortunate in many ways. But <clears throat> the other comment I will make, which kind of I think steps back and looks at this from a much broader perspective. If one looks at <clears throat> some of the more recent articles, I think it's in popular mechanics or it's in popular science where <clears throat> one of the, they show a spread and questions have come up here about fossil fuels, for example, but they show a spread on just exactly, you know, the, basically the title of the article is whether or not uh, additional drilling in the U.S., for example, could make up for the shortfall of oil. And I think that one of the contestants, uh, sorry, one of the panel uh, members mentioned this, mentioned this, that um, about, about, the, about the global oil supply and so forth peaking, the peak oil supply actually being predicted by like log, very reliable logarithmic models in the, in, the, in the production in the U.S., for example, for oil was predicted to peak sometime in the late or mid-1970s, which is exactly what it did. And now we're in that same sort of predictive mode for, for, uh, for world oil. But, but back to the, the point relative to, to U.S. demand versus production. If you look at that layout and that spread, the, U, the, the production of U.S. oil can only make up maybe a third to a half of the total demand in the United States. So there's absolutely no way that drilling, I mean, if one looks at that, the drilling in nature, in our domestic resources can make that up. The final, so as, as an overall perspective on, on oil, that's a, <clears throat> that's a point. But one other thing here that may not, people here may not be as aware of is that actually <clears throat> the chemical industry in the U.S. is enjoying somewhat of a boom because of this fracking, the fracking operations that are going on with natural gas and the fact that the, <clears throat> the cost of the feedstocks for natural gas is so much lower than that for oil. So it's actually giving them a competitive advantage now. All right. However, <clears throat> as has been pointed out, and I didn't hear any of the panelists mention this, I heard water mentioned and of course CO2, but methane, which is being released by these fraction, or, or, <laughs> sorry, fracking operations is actually even more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So if somebody wants to make a comment about that. Yeah, we're actually making measurements uh, both upwind and downwind of gas fields where fracking takes place. And uh, we can see a very significant enhancement in methane downwind 
of these uh, fracking operations. Larger than expected. Uh, a good number we don't have yet, but in a couple months maybe. Anybody else want to comment on that? Uh, there was a report that uh, an estimate that Australia, in Australia, 13% of the greenhouse gas effect being produced comes from the gases released by living cattle. Yeah, so we've known this for decades. <laughs> okay, we, we're getting near the end of the session. Uh, we're going to have these two speakers ask questions, and that's going to be it. So, Garrett. just sitting back watching this, there, there's been uh, a, a fair bit of acrimony, uh, some snickering, and uh, but then in the end of it, what really matters are the facts. And so, one question that wasn't re that isn't resolved in my mind, and excuse me for not remembering your names, uh, the sort of anti-anthropogenic gentleman in the black suit mentioned the, the, the large fluctu... D David? Uh, ma mentioned the, the large fluctuations uh, over a, a, lar a long period of time. And the gentleman on the far left uh, mentioned that even taking those into account, the, the uh, warming that we're seeing right now far exceeds that. Uh, and so that's something that where we could just look at some data and, and pretty well resolve it. And so that sort of thing seems would would seem to be helpful to me. Another issue was Henry mentioned the uh, um, warming within the Earth that there's evidence from uh, deep mines and so on. Uh, what sort of data is there? Uh, I, I guess it seems like there are a few very relevant uh, things that look to me like they, we have enough data to answer. These, uh, these factual questions to, to get us there. Uh, am, am I wrong? Um, Are you wrong? Is he wrong? It, Do we have enough data? If, if you uh, contact me right after this, I'll show you on my laptop uh, the 1,500-year cycles on temperatures where we were indeed warmer 5,000 years ago than today, and indeed 1,000 years ago as warm or warmer than today. And that, that's taken a fact. We even talked about that up in uh, Green, Greenland, the Vikings, uh, a thousand years ago. That's common knowledge that they settled up there a thousand years ago, and they could dig down four feet, four to five feet, I think, for graves to bury their dead, and then they had to move out of there once global cooling started coming back in. It's very known, and remember, 50% less ice uh, six, five thousand years ago. But I'll show you that data on my laptop right after the uh, talk here. Yeah, I mean, I would second your opinion that factual evidence should trump whatever sort of ram rambling discussions we might have up here. And I, I don't know if you're here this morning, but I tried to present factual evidence to show that indeed it's warmer now than any time it's been in the last 5,000 years. And you know, that's the best I can do is, is to present the actual evidence that's out there. And, and uh, it would challenge somebody to refute that. The, the data that different sides on this issue focus on is not the same. Another question from the audience, and then we'll bring it to an end. Um, so this is a little bit different, actually, which might be good. Um, on the topic of clean energy, if we're just going to talk about clean energy, whenever we have a debate about that in this country, um, it seems like there are proponents of it that jump on board and say, well, yeah, I totally believe in clean energy. That sounds great. It should be clean coal. And it seems like they're saying that probably because they have investment in clean coal and they have a selfish motivation for that. Or you have people who jump on board and say, and, and then you find out that they're invested in, in nuclear or whatever. How can we get around the selfish motivation of people who want to make money off of this process and just talk about, uh, instead of jumping on specific solutions, talking about it without that selfish piece in there? Do you understand the question? I, I don't have a personal interest in any particular energy solution. So uh, that means I'm credible? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to answer this one. Uh, uh, I, I spoke about the grant system uh, around the world, Europe and the United States, about uh, the manipulation uh, of the grant system for the global warming effort. Uh, you, uh, the government provides a grant that's political. 
my research, I'm not funding, funded by anyone, no one at all. And this is the difference. This is real research. With, I, I, when I started it, I didn't know how it was going to come out. And it came out, the natural cycles, and showing what's going to be happening in the future. And I'm not funded by any energy uh, companies, any governments. It's just unbiased. Uh, so you are implying that I'm, uh, I'm working on global warming because you're I'm getting paid money for it. off of it. You're getting paid for it. The opposite is true. As a student, <laughs> I became interested in the issue because I thought this is going to be an important problem. I could have made a lot more money personally if I had stayed in solid state physics, which I was doing at the time. What I was saying is you're getting paid by a political entity that has has their feet in there. Well, I'm getting issue, paid by no one. It's an well, issue of great importance to society, and I'm glad governments want to invest in, in investigating this issue. They would be shirking their responsibility if they didn't. But it's the government setting up the policies and the grants. Well, there well, is a problem here. It's true that the scientists at the university are receiving grants from the government. My experience is that they send in a, a, a grant proposal and then probably do something different than what the grant proposal said that happens. You are writing books and I assume you're selling those books and so you're pushing your position. We all do that, we can't avoid it. I will say this about the discussion this evening. I gather from this morning and this evening that both sides of the issue agree that at the moment the situation is warming. Some agree that it should, it's going to continue to warm. Some say it's going to cool. And I am very happy to hear that there was a very definite prediction made that by something around 2020, 20, 23, somewhere in there. 2018. Well, that's when it was going to begin. And But OK, so within the next 20 years or so, 10 years or so, either it's going to be cool or it's going to be hotter. And whichever it is will tell us the answer to this debate. And I suspect that it's not going to matter a lot that 10 years whether we've started to invest in extra dikes in Holland or whether we haven't. I want to thank our panel. They've done a very good job, and I appreciate it. And I thank you for being here.